and they ended the largest land and sea war ever fought between two nations at that time. Teddy Roosevelt got the Nobel Peace Prize for this, and he deserved it for getting in there and the back channel diplomacy. But what we found compelling in the course of the peace treaty 100th anniversary celebration was the way Roosevelt entrusted local people to be involved in the international process by facilitating communication in the atmosphere for peace. And I can tell you that what was even as compelling today is that I think that the commemoration of it showed that American people locally, where we are, hunger for that opportunity again. And as I said, we'll discuss it some more. I think you'll find it absolutely fascinating if you study um, the process that actually occurred and your information on the fact. Uh, I, as we progress, I just want to make clear to people, you see there's clips on your table. As you get thoughts, as you get comments, write them on a piece of paper, please, and then put them on that clip, because what will happen is people will be coming around and they will be looking for paper on that clip to, to collect. So please do that as inspiration uh, comes to you. Uh, Mr. Dolak, you just mentioned among the groups that, that, that were active in was the, the, the religious groups. And of course, right now we're looking at a time where um, the, the mention of religion seems to be, be automatically associated with a problem rather than any possibility of a solution. I would like to ask uh, Professor Pashui. <coughs> Professor Pashui, who was actually uh, among his enormous experience, from 1982 to 1986, he was a senior cultural advisor President of Lebanon. And it was a period of tough, great conflict in the country that has suffered conflict that, uh, that many times over. Uh, but he was responsible for trying to explore various ways to try to get the watering parties to at least come to some understanding. Drawing on his knowledge, I know, uh, Professor Shri, that at the recent G8 summit, if I am correct, you recently submitted a report at that summit which uh, particularly discussed the concept you want to introduce called a spiritual foundation of a global ethic, which I interpret as being religion as a solution, not a problem. Uh, but let me hear your interpretation. Could you share with us what you introduced at the GA conference under that rubric and how it fits into what you discussed? Yes, sir. <coughs> exactly. Thank many other uh, uh, through the G8 summit uh, this last summer was the spiritual foundation for the global ethos, the Baha'i perspective. Uh, I thought that uh, it was important that I present with others because there were other points of view, uh, the Baha'i perspective on globalization. I come from a completely different background, and very, this is very distinguished country. I really shouldn't be here, of course. <laughs> I, I am, I'm a student of literature and poetry. I did Islamic studies and English literature. Uh, quite a strange combination, really. And I began to develop this interest in poetry and in the great poets. And I found that the universities, really, great poets of all time, want to really summarize Western uh, civilization, there are three names, Dante, Goethe, Shakespeare. That's it. And so, so there, 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 I come from that. I was invited by the President of Lebanon at the most difficult time in history of Lebanon to help him bring about an understanding between the Muslim and Christian factions in Lebanon. I am very glad to say that today, although Lebanon is again in trouble, but it's not a religious issue now. It's, it's a regional issue with enormous complexity. However, I asked the President that he be kind enough not to announce it. You want to succeed in diplomacy? Don't talk about it. Begin the process. The word diplomacy itself uh, 
still are that we have the same in Arabic, not to look at like Sabi Kafir, he who reports heresy is not a heretic. The word diplomacy is, uh, is it uh, something you say you don't mean? Is it politeness that is not genuine? Is it the truth really and not the truth? These are issues that really come to mind. Uh, therefore, I would prefer the word attitude. Attitude, what is your attitude to your adversary? We began to talk with the president on the issues of how to bring it. And I suggested that the best way is poetry, literature, mm. culture. And then to begin to see the literature of Islam and the literature of Christianity, where the two meet. I produced for the president uh, this document, which I have with me now. Uh, and it said languages are external and their multiplicity leads men to fighting and hatred. But Sufis now know that the inner meaning which these languages point to is one and the same. Ibn Arabi, the great Arab philosopher, conveys this to directly without his recourse to a Arabic like group. But at the center of our lives, I think, and the majority of the people of the world are like this, although anybody who is an atheist, you know, doesn't does it need to feel that it's outside the circle? Because we believe in something. If you believe in life, you believe. Because God is life. And the issue here is God. Where is God in this equation? The, well, uh, the great thing has come. Let me read this. Arabs call God Allah. Persian Khuda. Greeks Theo. Armenians as Tabats, Turks, Tanari, Franks, the Creator, Ethiopians, Wak. Thus, the pronounced words are different, but the meaning is one for all. We try to develop a language, language of communication between Christians and Muslims, and the language of literature seems to be ideal. I will quote later on, if you don't mind, and you are not bored by poetry, I will do that. I think for the students here, there's always some secondary serendipitous benefit. If any of you are taking literature classes and don't know the answer to a question, you can always say, Dante, Goethe, Shakespeare. Well, <laughs> 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 and you can you can quote the best of the time. <laughs> uh, but, but the point comes up, uh, in, 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 precisely in Professor, outlining the the similarities, the diversities of people. Uh, one of the questions that I was having from the background as an anthropologist is we use that question, people, and uh, very freely and very, very general fashion. But the question is, who are the people? Which, which people are we talking about? And when we talk about people to people, to which people to which people are we talking about? I would like to ask uh, Dr. Bonnie Foster to, we like this, uh, the, the Phelps Stoke Foundation, which, which uh, he is now the head of, among its illustrious trustees was Dr. Ralph Bunch, who was the first African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, Dr. Dr. Bunch had many, many outstanding qualities, uh, which I discussed uh, the Phelps Stoke Fund's desire to open to create a society that helps propagate them and, and instill them in a new generation. Among them, as I understand it, I am not an expert at all, was Dr. Bunch's perspective, belief in, in um, the power of different people to share their experiences with the benefits of, of greater purposes. Uh, can you, uh, does that make, is that true? Can, can you tell us sort of out of the experience of Ralph Fudge, even out of the experience of both Stokes Fudge and Kennedy, who are the people that we really have to recognize and we really have to be in dialogue with each other, besides the obvious? Well, let me stick with Ralph Bunch. Uh, first of all, there was an American Negro uh, fact was related to Bob Henderson's family. And he was, came from a single parent family and grew up. He was a great athlete, he was a scholar. He was a civil rights activist. He worked for 